for the past semester, uh, the African American Studies Center and the School of Education are co-sponsoring a two-credit course, course on the miseducation of black boys. As most of you in the room know, that there are certain uh, demographic groups who, just by the nature of the group into which they are born, are at significant risk for academic failure. Uh, the more African American males in prison than there are in college, and the litany goes on and on. And so, in general, there is this incredibly negative uh, public image of what it means to teach in lower income schools, to work with lower income families and specifically that uh, those issues get stereotyped in the life of black boys. So it's rare in the educational establishment to find somebody who has such a clear vision of what is strong and powerful in the life of black boys and girls and other uh, kids of color and is willing to dedicate their life in this incredible combination of direct instruction and teaching being in the classroom, running a school, influencing policy throughout the state of California, and uh, also being willing to come out and share his perspective with the rest of the world. So I've had Dr. Holly come in and work with trainings uh, with me in, in Wisconsin. And the one thing I would like to say, as many of you know, that as open as I am for discussion and dialogue, I'm hard to convince. Uh, particularly when I have a strong opinion. And he was able to lead me into understanding of the ling linguistic issues for uh, African-American families in a way that I found it not only powerful in its intellectual quality, but convincing in terms of structuring of my own approaches to pedagogy. So without much further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Holly to you and turn the mic over and hope you enjoy it and be ready and be willing to ask a lot of stimulating questions at the end. Thanks. Good evening. Good evening. Come on, I'm from LA. Good evening. Good evening. I want to thank uh, Dean Coleman for the invitation. It's good to know people in high places, as they say. And um, I appreciate him bringing me out um, to Boston University. It's my, really my first time in Boston. I was here when I was a kid, don't remember too much. So I was very uh, open to the invitation, even though I was hoping for a little warmer weather, of course. Um, but oh well. Um, and um, as, he, as he said, you know, we, um, we're sort of at the crossroads of doing this work. Um, and I kind of uh, have three different vantage points that I think benefit overall. And I'm just going to cover them a little bit. And then I'm just going to jump right into what we do. Um, the first vantage point is from the university perspective. I'm a professor at Cal State Dominguez Hills, which is essentially uh, a, te a teacher training university. We, uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills credentials the most teachers of color in California. And um, we, I work there and, and mainly in secondary education around reading language uh, literacy issues. Um, a lot of our students work in the LA sort of stereotypical urban schools, you know, Los Angeles Unified, Compton, Long Beach, many of our students uh, go into that. I work the past couple of years with uh, Teach for America cohort. Um, so I have spe specifically Teach for America students, which is a whole nother story. Um, I'm trying to convince them to stay longer than two years, which uh, I think we're doing an okay job. Um, that's one vantage point. So I have that sort of perspective of uh, the university trying to deal with this. Uh, then my second vantage point is as a co-director and founder of an independent charter school in Los Angeles called the Culture and Language Academy of Success. And that's a kindergarten through eighth grade school. We have 350 students. And we're known um, because we have all African-American students. We're 100% African-American. And uh, the only all African-American school in the state, um, and certainly in the LA area. And we have uh, great uh, literacy results. 60% uh, of our students score 80, 60% uh, and above in uh, AYP, the Annual Yearly Progress, which is the federal the federal monitor. Um, so we have, uh, we have people come up from all over the country to see what we're doing around the linguistic uh, uh, affirmation that we do. And then my third hat is what I'm doing with you today. Um, well, let me go back. Certainly being at the school site keeps me grounded, keeps it real, if, you're, if you know what I mean. So, because we're dealing with students, we're dealing with parents, we're dealing with all the issues that are at a school site. And our goal was to create a school-wide model using the approach I'm gonna introduce to you today. 
So um, that's very important work for me because I don't get too distant from what the real issues are in terms of working with African-American children, particularly African-American males, where we have a reputation for having a lot of success. A lot of, a lot of schools send us the students who they're having trouble with, per se, right? But when they come to our school, um, they don't have, I would say, as much trouble. We had a student, um, his name is, uh, I can say his name, his name is Craig Jones, and he went to the UCLA uh, sort of laboratory school. It's called Seeds Elementary. And uh, he was in the office every single day. His parents are well-to-do. His mom's a lawyer. Um, his dad is a professional. And uh, he was in the office every day. And his mom brought him to us, and she said, I know my kid's not bad. He's a good kid. But for whatever reason, he stays in the office. I think in the three years that Craig was with us, he was only in the office twice. Well, with me at least, right? <laughs> and now he goes to uh, Loyola High School in, uh, in LA, which is a pretty high level parochial school there for us in the community there. So we've had, a, we've had some success using the approach I'm gonna introduce with those students. The last hat is what I'm doing with you today, and that's traveling around the country, teaching teachers about the approach. And in the context, as Dean Coleman mentioned, of the failure, that's, I'm not there uh, for my good looks, you know what I'm saying? I'm there because, uh, as you can see, I'm not a humble guy, right? Um, I'm there because the school is in some type of uh, program improvement status. They are in, under some type of mandate, some type of edict around their lack of success with um, namely African-American students, but we can broaden that. And they've been told if you don't demonstrate or if you don't show that you're, that you're doing something to specifically address this, then you know we're going to come with some type of sanction or something like that. So many of the districts and many of the teachers that I work with, they're under that pressure. And it's sort of been a good thing in a way that it sort of opened the door for this conversation. Because prior, I've been doing this about 11 years now, prior to No Child Left Behind, you really didn't have a lot of these school districts open to this type of conversation. So it's, it's, been, uh, it's had an unintended effect, I think. And so we work primarily in Northern California, but we have situations in St. Louis, in um, New York, um, and different places. And what I mean by that is that means that we're working with the students and the teachers in the classroom, which is our overall goal. So that's sort of where I'm coming from. So what you see here is sort of a mixture of all of that kind of put together. So just to kind of go along with the theme of the time, I changed my title to Your Culture Responsive Stimulus Package. And I'm looking at it, you know, we are, we're what, in terms of what, how we can take some of the lessons that we're trying to learn from the economic situation and how can we apply it to the education situation. And the economic situation it has been described as a crisis. And certainly those of us who've been in education, we, could pr we can make a similar description as a crisis. But we see every crisis as an opportunity, as um, has been said. And so this is an opportunity for us to really um, bring a layer that we think can benefit uh, any type of attempt to try to bring improvement and change. And that is culturally and linguistically responsive teaching. And I'm just going to define it for you real fast. Culturally and linguistically responsive teaching is the validation and affirmation of the home language and culture for the purposes of transi transitioning or bridging for academic success and success in mainstream culture. And so what you're going to do is you're going to go to where the students are so that you can bring them where they need to be or, as we call it, be situationally appropriate. And situationally appropriate is really learning what culture, cultural and linguistic norm is appropriate for the situation that I can code switch to, but without losing who I am in that process. So I don't have to change uh, what's internal to me, culturally and linguistically, in order to speak standard English or academic language, depending on my audience. I can still maintain that. And that's what we do. That's what we do at our school in terms of our entire teaching. And what we're simply saying is that the school system b is really based on making that code switch, but at the expense of who you are. And secondly, not going to where the students are. The analogy that we use is simply trying to think about how you learn, if you think about how you learned how to swim. Now, how you learned how to swim, probably one of two ways. The first way is you were thrown into the pool, and the teacher was on the side saying, that's it, kick, come on, do it, do it, do it, as you were flailing and like not, it wasn't happening. And we know that in education to be the, what type of approach? It's called the sink or what? Swim approach, right? 
Then there's a second type where the teacher is actually in the pool with you, guiding you, holding you, instructing you, and then somehow slowly kind of lets go, and then you're doing it on your own. That's the approach that we're shooting for, the one where we meet the students in the pool and bring them along the way. So it has two components to it. The first component is culturally understanding where we are, and then the second component is linguistically understanding where we are. And it's based in instructional uh, strategies, and that's why 90% of whom I talk to are classroom, practicing classroom teachers, because we're trying to get them to do their instruction in a different way, with, by first starting with their mindset and then, starting with the, and then ending with the practice. So what we're saying is we're not going to use, uh, you know, guest speakers. We're not going to use posters. We're not going to use some type of ethnic cultural month. We're not going to use um, ethnic food day. We're not going to use ethnic dress day. That's not how we're going to get at this issue of diversity. That's not how we're going to get at this issue of culture. We're going to get at it by understanding more so where the students are culturally and linguistically and how we can accommodate or be responsive to them through the instructional practice, how we teach. And it's through that experience for the students that will bring about the change that we want to see with them academically, behaviorally, and so on. So I want to begin, just to change the energy in the room, is to, uh, by doing an activity with you, um, and then coming back to talk a little bit about race and, and culture, then going to another activity, and then coming back to talk about the language piece. So that's how we're going to sort of tag team this. Hopefully each of you has a strip. The packet that you have is sort of pieces of my full day packet, which is uh, you know a six hour presentation. And I you know I just didn't know I didn't know it's hard to determine your audience, so I kind of put in a little bit of everything. And some of it we'll get to, some of it we won't. Um, and I'll explain you know what each is as we go along. Then you have um, which is really a promotional piece through Prentice Hall, as I'm one of the contributing artists for Prentice Hall. Um, We'll fix this in a minute. Um, and what we're going to be doing is, um, you know, we, we work with Prentice Hall in how they can infuse some of these strategies into their text. Then I also have a DVD clip that I want to show towards the end, because a lot of people want to see, like, what does it actually look like in the classroom? So I'm going to show you a clip from our charter school that shows you what it looks like in the classroom. And one of the advantages that we have in something that's a highly theoretical area, culturally responsive teaching, is we have the practice part. So it's not just, it's not just theory. In fact, in our full sessions, it's very little theory. Um, it's only the first uh, part of the day, and then the rest of the day we focus on strategies. So you have these strips, and we're going to do an activity that's called a tea party, a tea party. And now this is a culturally and linguistic responsive strategy that comes out of second language learning. And what the big issue is you understanding what makes it culturally responsive. And what's make, what makes it culturally responsive is that, first of all, is movement. There's movement involved. And movement, in this case, means you're going to be getting out of your seats, all right? You're going to be standing up, okay? The second piece that makes it culturally responsive is that it's sociocentric. And what that means is that it involves talking as part of the instruction. Because many, many times the students who are being unsuccessful they are being who they are, but in the context of school, it's seen as negative, it's seen as disruptive, defiant, deviant, whatever is on the referral slip, basically, right? And a lot of these kids end up in the office for reasons that are, we feel, culturally based. And in the classroom, there's just a cultural misunderstanding. So what we try to get teachers to do is build in who they are into the instruction. So you have to build in talking. That doesn't mean that the students get to talk when they want, however they want, but we're going to allow them that sort of momentary exchange prior to jumping into the content, okay? The other aspect of this is the greeting. How you greet somebody is cultural as well. We're going to build that in as well. So these are all what we call cultural ori orientations. So the rules for this tea party is, number one, you have to stand up and walk around. That's number one, okay? Number two, prior to introducing your content, you have to culturally greet the person, right? And that means physically and verbally. And it may be, 
it has to be through a cult orientation, which may be, I don't have anybody in the front row, so I can't do this, um, is, is uh, some type of, like a soul shake, if that's your cultural orientation, and I would be demonstrating this, um, or a uh, cheek, uh, cheek kiss, both sides, if that's a cultural orientation, high five, elbow, pound, uh, bear hug, whatever, whatever, right? And, you know, we understand that now the hug has become the new handshake. You guys know that, right? Right? That people are hugging more now than handshaking. So um, whatever cultural orientation works for you, all right? And then as part of the verbal part, I just want you to tell the person, I'm, I'm my best today because, okay? Because we have to give the students some frame. Otherwise, they will talk about whatever they, you know, the kind of goofy stuff that middle school or secondary students talk about, right? So you have to give them, you know, give them a frame. So I want you to say, hi, my name is so-and-so, and I'm my best today because, and then you sort of fill in that blank. Then you're going to jump into your content, and in this case, the content is to read the strips to one another verbatim, verbatim, all right? Don't cheat. I want you to read it just like it is on the on the table, on the, on, the, on the slip, and then you kind of go like, wow, that's interesting, or I'm not sure what you just said, but whatever, whatever you want to do there, okay? And then you, you uh, go to a different, peop different person. I want you to do this with three different people in the room, three different people in the room, and then after that third person, you return to your seats. Now, the last rule is you, you can't talk to anybody in your row. So these four ladies right here, they can't talk to one another. Okay, these two gentlemen here, they can't talk to one another. So you can't talk to anyone in your immediate row, and that's to encourage us kind of walking around mixing up with one another. All right? So, yes. That's good, because you're both going to exchange based on your own orientation. So if yours is a high five and then hers is a bear hug, then that's how you do it like that, right? Now, we don't want to put somebody uncomfortable because you could say, well, mine is the French kiss. And they go like, no, I don't think so, right? Okay, so we, we, we have limits. We have boundaries, all right? Okay, are we ready? No, no. no we're not. No, 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 no. The, 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 the cultural orientation has nothing to do with the strip. You do your cultural orientation. The strip is just separate from that, okay? All right, go. Again, this is, notice how the energy in the room changes when we do something like this, and the cultural pieces are built in. Now, from a sort of pedagogical standpoint, this is um, simply an in, into reading activity. So we're about to read uh, some text, and I want to get the students familiar with the language, number one, and then also some of the, character, the characterizations, just so they can get a general sense of the story. Um, so it's an into read, it's an into activity. Um, when I was in a classroom, I used to put Shakespeare, lines from Shakespeare on those strips prior to reading Romeo and Juliet. Or you could put math problems on the strips, or you can put science, whatever, and then have the students in, in exchange like this and then come back in, and read and, uh, and, and then par get ready to participate in the reading. So also, in terms of uh, second language issues or learning, it's, uh, it's meant to generate language in the room. And that's so uh, important for the sociocentric aspect because a lot of issues for students learning standard English is needing to sort of be able to speak it and hear it um, because usually at school, for many of these students, it's one of the few places they're going to get access um, in this type of way. So we want to have those opportunities for them to engage one another in different types of ways. And so that simple activity like that enables me to accomplish all of that. And at the same time, I'm building in that culture and language piece. And so that's just a sample of what we do in terms of a, a whole sort of body of work with, with teachers to get them to, to focus on what they need to focus on. The first thing that we have to do, though, is talk about what is culture and why, why do we have this focus? And so I want to just give you a little bit of that so you'll understand the basis of this. What we have to do is, un, is, is really quickly uh, or, or just really to the point. We don't have to spend a lot of time. We don't, we don't really need a lot of statistics, okay? Um, I, have a, I have a standard uh, sort of bet across the country with anybody who could find me 
positive statistics that are n not related to the achievement gap. We don't even call it achievement gap anymore because it doesn't accurately define the weight or the crisis of the problem. See, a gap seems small. This is a, you know, I don't even know what you want to call it. This is a, this is a, this is an ocean. This is a, it's huge when you really look at it. So we don't, we already, we already know. I used to show a whole bunch of data slides, but it's no, it's no point. I mean, everyone knows the sort of depth of the issue. Um, so we have to, we have to just cut to the chase and say, well, who are we talking about? And we sort of broaden it to say underserved students first, so that we understand that the schools. And we talk, in terms of talking about their failure, ha have not been successful with many populations, many populations. So we talk about underserved being any student who's in the school system that is not being responded to in a way that he or she can be successful. That's how we define underserved. And for a moment, it takes it off race, culture, and language so that um, I could be in a district in Kansas that's 90% white, yet still talking about this topic, right? because we're addressing it under this broader notion of who's underserved in the school district. But then we ask the question, if we were to bring the underserved students to the auditorium, what would they look like, right? Using that broad definition, any student who's not being responded to in a way that he or she can be successful, think about who those students are. Now, let's bring them to the auditorium. Who do they look like? and match with the research, they look like these students here. Now enters race, culture, and language because those are the students that are being identified as underserved. And the point that we have to make is that that's not where we started, though. We started with a broader, with a broader, with a broader definition. But the research says that these are the ones who are most likely to be underserved. And in terms of a cultural way of looking at it, there's, uh, there's particular four groups, and the broader area is voluntary immigrants versus involuntary immigrants. And we're pulling from the work of John Ogbu, early, late 70s sort of work, where he basically said that, you know, there are two types of students in the American education system, voluntary immigrants, involuntary immigrants. And he said that they have different paths. One is a path to success. The other one is, a, is, is not successful. And under the involuntary immigrants, we looked at these four populations in particular because we noticed that they had a sociopolitical and sociolinguistic commonality. The sociopolitical commonality was they were colonized, conquered, or enslaved as their introduction into America, meaning that the process of assimilation came through this process here, being colonized, conquered, or enslaved. And they were Hawaiian Americans, Native Americans, Mexican Americans, and African Americans. And, and you know, in the full day, we would talk about a little bit about that history. And what we realize is that they were essentially locked out of the system that makes them quote unquote Americans, if you will, and therefore never really had that access or opportunity. And it's different for each one. So in the context of Africans in America, we're looking at a 300-year history of being locked out. Then we have a sociolinguistic commonality, meaning that in these, in these first two genera generations, they spoke um, the uh, transition from their indigenous languages to what the linguists call non-standard languages, what we call hybrid languages. And so today, um, there, it's known as Hawaiian Pidgin English, Native American dialects, Chicano English for Mexican Americans, and Black English or African American vernacular English and that these are intact linguistic entities that are based on that history of being locked out of formal second language instruction if you came about through one of these ways. So again, using the Africans as an example, when the Africans came to any of the Americas, these, these were the rules. If you speak your African tongue, it'll be cut out. If you congregate with two or three or more, you'll be beaten. It's against the law for you to learn the, the language of the land. You can't go to school. No Rosetta Stone, right? Okay? And so the linguists begin to ask, well, then how could they acquire the language? And so some linguists have a theory that is based on a relaxified language, which means you have the, the vocabulary of the dominating culture, but you still have the grammatical base of the indigenous, indigenous language in place. Okay? And so culturally and linguistically, that's what we have going on with these two, with these, with these uh, four. 
uh, populations in particular, as we define them as being underserved. We are, another way that we look at it is we call them standard English learners. And a standard English learner is defined that they speak a home language that differs, and this is important, in all the dimensions of language. So it differs in terms of the phonology, the morphosyntax, uh, the syntax, which is the grammar, the, the semantics, vocabulary, and even the rhetorical aspect, which is the discourse, how you tell the story. And these students then come into a situation, school, where if you go through each category, they, they, they do it differently. And so what we have to do then is recognize them as standard English learners and then begin to use instruction that would be responsive to them being in the situation. And that's going to we feel like it's going to get them to the success we want them to have for standard English and academic language. The problem is, though, that many folks do not see the legitimacy in terms of these four groups, culture and language. And so that's where the validation and affirmation comes in. So validate for us is to make legitimate what mainstream has made illegi illegitimate and the institution has made illegitimate, culturally and linguistically. And affirm is to make positive what the institution and mainstream media has made negative for culture and language for these groups. So when we think of Hawaiian Americans, Native Americans, Mexican Americans, African Americans, we don't think of legitimacy in terms of culture and language. So when you say, well, what is, what is African American language or what is Chicano English, people would give it a deficit sort of definition, ghetto, gibberish, uh, broken English, so on and so forth, no legitimacy. If you say, well, what, what is black culture? What do you mean by black culture? Are you talking about hip hop? No legitimacy. Are you talking about you know food, dress, dance, music? No legitimacy. So what we have to do is take a little time to talk about if we're going to be culturally responsive, then we have to legitimize what has been made illegitimate by the institution in very explicit terms. So we do this through an activity that we're just going to do a little bit of that's, that we delve into what is culture, what is Ebonics, and then how is it playing to the failure of the system. And we do this um, by, folk, by it's, a, it's a diversity activity that's called our, Why Are We Confused? But I've changed it to Is Obama Our First Black President? All right? And what I mean by that is this right here. I'm going to give you a statement. If you understand this statement, then you are not confused. If you don't understand the statement, then I'm sorry to tell you you're confused, okay? You can be African American but, and not black. You can be African American and not black, all right? Now, if you understand what I'm saying, you're not confused. But if some of you looking like, what the heck is he talking about right now, then you are confused. And I want to I talk about that confusion a little bit because this is what confounds the issue in terms of culturally responsive teaching in particular, but I also think in terms of how we're dealing with the achievement gap. Because we have misidentified our labels, if you will, right? Um, and the Barack Obama reference is, Initially, he had issues around legitimizing himself to the black community as being a, a candidate of, of, of black culture, if you will, versus just being an African-American, okay? And it took him a while to sort of gain that type of support. I mean, there are different variables, but it took him a while to gain that, th that type of support. Um, and, and I think part of it is because when you look at someone racially, you, it's different when you're looking at them ethnically. But when it comes to the four groups I just described, there is, there's not that ethnic identification, all right? So we can't go through all these identities today, but I want to give you the, 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 how we're all layered in these ways, and we recognize those. We're all sort of created by all these different identities, and we have to peel the onion to understand them each in their place in a sort of analytical way then it makes, when we put them back together, it makes it stronger, which I call the true definition of diversity, is looking at us in all these different ways. What I want to do is, race, I want to start off with the race one, and then see if we can jump, we can jump down to culture, since that's the, that's the main focus. So what I want you to do, you're going to do it just in the area where you are right now. I want you to give me your DNA lineage. What is your DNA lineage? What is your race? 
all right? I'm talking about your blood lineage. How would you identify yourself racially, okay? And it's really just a one-word answer. And then I want you to try to give two identifiers that make you that race, if you will. Two things that you can say, I think this is what I'm associated with racially, okay? Now, being from Boston is not a race. Okay, I just want to save a little time, all right? So we don't have that, we don't have that issue, okay? Being Irish is not a race, okay? So I want to save some time on that end as well. We're really looking at DNA. Like if they found your bones 80 years from now somewhere, what would they, what would they come up with? And you're going to do this by whipping around, what we call a whip around. That means you share in groups of three or four, and you just go around and you say, this is my race, this is what identifies me and then you bring it back. It should take no longer than two minutes per group because you're talking for 30 seconds or less. So I'm gonna call us back in about two minutes, okay? So with your group right now, identify your race. What we do is first we try to debunk some myths, basically, if you will, or different ways of looking at it. Number one is typically, you know, and I've, you know, we do this with all sizes, all different groups. Somebody in a group will say, I'm of the human race. Right, we got any humans out there? <laughs> All right, uh, show some love for the humans. <laughs> and we try to point out that, you know, being human only separates us from the other animals in the kingdom, basically. It just lets us know that, you know, you're not a billy goat, your presence here right now, unless you want to demonstrate something for us at six o'clock or whenever we're in this, right? And that there are races within the human race. So we're just talking about the animal kingdom. The second thing that we have to sort of debunk or address is this notion of mixed racial heritage, right? Because we're in this age where everybody's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, and, you know, it's kind of like, what am I? Well, if we understand our social history, our social history tells us very clearly, if you had any drop of non-European blood, then that's what race you were. And if that blood was African, it trumped everything. That's what our social history says. It's only till recently, very recently, that we began to acknowledge this notion of biracial or multiracial in terms of designation, okay? Because today you can actually buy your DNA breakdown at a cheap rate, relatively cheap rate. But I think a lot of people won't do it because they don't want to find out the truth. They don't want to find out where that kitchen came from. Now only people who know where the kitchen is going to get that joke. <laughs> If you don't know what a kitchen is, you're not going to get that joke, <laughs> right? So people will, help, will be able to get to sleep tonight and not wonder what a kitchen is. The kitchen is the backside of your hair that naps up, and it's called the kitchen. And typically, people of African descent have kitchens, right? So if you want to know if you have some African blood in you, one way to check is see if you got a kitchen, right? And, and it's, a, it's a joke, but that's, that's, that's speaking to how the DNA ties in. Now, I know some of you, when you leave, you're going to walk down the hallway and you're going to go, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, the third thing, and I want to acknowledge the scientists, the people who, you know, uh, go with the racial is socially constructed argument. I mean, you know, and that is that we're 99.9% .9 alike genetically, okay, which is a scientific fact. But we think it's irrelevant to what's been happening in terms of the racial strife turmoil that's happened in our history. It's really, it's really just a scientific fact. It has had no relevance in terms of, who we, of what we've had to deal with based on that minute difference. So we go back and we just study how does this racial classification come from. And it comes from partly due to the work of J.F. Blumenbach, who did the first scientifically received racial classification. And Blumenbach went all over the world and he, he was looking for the, for the most beautiful race of men. And he said that the people who lived in, in Russia near Mount Caucasus were the most beautiful race of men on earth. And he named them Caucasians, Caucasians. And that's where the term Caucasian comes from based on the arbitrary decision of J.F. Blumenbach, okay? So we have to understand that. And so then Blumenbach, kind of getting to the gentleman's question, then classify races based on geography, based on geography. And he had an initial five groups, Caucasian, 
Mongolian, Ethiopian, what he called natives or Americans, and then Malaysians. So if we were to follow the Blumenbach classification, all of us would fall under one of these five, okay? Blumenbach really, though, had a major contribution in terms of what we would identify as racially acceptable in terms of image that still stands with us today, let alone the term Caucasian, still stands with us today based on Blumenbach. But it's what he put forth, what was representative of beauty, that has stood and permeated in how we navigate, especially in the context of the school, but also in the macrocosm. Now, a lot of people, they don't believe what I'm saying for whatever reason. So we go to the original source of J.F. Blumenbach, this is what he said. On the Caucasian variety, I've taken the name of this variety from Malcacaucus, both because its neighborhood and especially the southern slope produces the most beautiful race of men. I mean the Georgian. And because all the physiological reasons converge to this. Besides, it is white in color, which we may fairly assume to be the primitive color of mankind, since it is very easy to degenerate into brown, but very much more difficult for dark to become white. And so he set forth with those words a mindset that would be representative of beauty that everything would be compared to based on an image. And remember, image is connected to mindset. I mean, we have the re you know, research about commercials and symbols and all that. Image co contributes to mindset. And the mindset is that this image here would be representative of beauty. Now, you just think about it in a macrocosm. Think about um, our heroes. Think about our heroes and how they match the image. Think about our images of Jesus Christ and how they match the image. Think about Barbie dolls, you know, the 50th anniversary of Barbie doll we're celebrating. And the image has remained the same over that time. And those dolls, when they want to quote unquote change the race, they're not racially changed, they're just dipped in a different color. But racially, it remains the same based on here, right here. By the way, Dora is now outselling Barbie. Just want, this is a side note, you want to know that, right? <laughs> Worldwide, Dora the Explorer outsells Barbie now, right? Okay, so maybe there's, come a, there's a change coming there a little bit, right? Okay, so think of the school system and the images. Think of the textbooks, the literature books, the things that students have to look through. You know, Carl Grant, who studies textbooks, says that African-American students have a 7% chance of seeing an image that's truly reflective of who they are in the American textbook. Just a 7% chance. And then it gets less as you go through the different groups. So all this ties into cultural responsive teaching in that in order to be culturally responsive, we have to work around where we're starting from in terms of that validation and affirmation. So when you come to our school, the students are inundated with images that are representative of who they are of who they are. The, the, the images are, are the, when they look in the books, they see themselves. Now, I'm not saying solely, but I'm saying as a starting place. Because remember, we're going to transition them to what's going to be representative in the mainstream and in academia. So we're not trying to stay there. We're just trying to start there. Rather than starting at what the society says, where the society says what you're not. So in order for a student to feel empowered, affirmed, validated, feel confident, you have to start where they are. And we know that a lot of the issues around African Americans, particularly African American males, is that they're not being approached or addressed based on who they are. They're being approached, they're being addressed on based on what we want them to be. And we have to start where they are to move them in that, in that, in that direction. I want to give it to you from a student's perspective. So let me show you this clip from, uh, this actually was sent to me by one of the teachers that we train in Oakland. He's the video teacher at a high school. This was a, a video that was done by high school students. And it was done around um, issues of race. And it lets you know that when we allow the students to really grapple with this, they have the wherewithal to kind of come up and, and approach it from where we're coming from. Um, it was a spoken word contest that the particular gentleman won, and then they took the spoken word contest and then showed it and, 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 and turned it into this video. My 
glitters burn through her. And I'm sure that such actions aren't foreign to her because the essence of her beauty is, well, the essence of beauty. And in the presence of this higher being, the weakness of my masculinity kicks in, causing me to personify my wannabe, big brother, shot caller, God gifted the female features, the shiny shoe, rapping, rapping, like, I give a crack and shorty, how you live on what you saw, what you size, I dig your style, yo. Now, this girl was no fool, she gives me a dirty look with the quickness, like, boy, you must be stupid, so I'm looking at myself like, boy, you must be stupid. But looking upon her, I am kind of feeling her style. So I try again, but instead of adjusting her properly, I blurt out one of my fake-ass playlistic lines, like, girl, you must be a traffic ticket, because you got fine written all over you. <laughs> now, she's trying to leave, and I'm trying to keep her here. And so with a final attempt, I blatter, girl, what is your ethnic makeup? See? At this point, her glare is scorching through me. And somehow she manages to make her brown eyes resemble some kind of brown fire or something. But there's no snap or head movement, no palm to face, click of tongue, middle finger, roll of eyes, or girl power chant. She just glares at me with these burning eyes, and her gaze grabs me with the throat, and she says, ethnic makeup? First of all, makeup just an anglicized, colonized, commodified utility that my sisters have been programmed to consume, forcing them to come for a third natural state in order to admit that when another sister looks like in her natural state, because people keep telling her that the other sister's natural state is more beautiful than the first sister's natural state. At the same time, the other sister isn't even in her natural state because she's trying to imitate yet another sister. So in actuality, the natural state that the first sister was trying to imitate wasn't even natural in the first place. Now, I'm thinking, damn, this girl's kicking knowledge. But meanwhile, she keeps spitting on it like fine. I'll tell you about my ethnic makeup. I wear foundation, not that powdery stuff. I wear the foundation laid by my indigenous people. It's that foundation that makes it so the past being globalized, I can still vocalize with confidence. I know where my roots are. I wear this foundation not upon my face, but within my soul. And I take this from my ancestors, because I'll be damned if I ever let a European or American corporation tell me what my foundation should look like. And I'll wear lipstick, for my lips stick to the ears of men so they can experience and surround sound my screams of agony with each lash of rulers, measuring tape, and scales, as if my waistline and weight are inversely proportional to my value as a human being. See, my lips, they stick, but not together. Rather, they flail open with flames to burn down this culture that once kept them shut. Now I mess with eyeshadow, but my eyes shadow over this time now where you're gonna end to keep me blind, but you can't cover my eyes, look into them. My eyes foreshadow change, my eyes foreshadow light, and I'm not into hair dyeing, but I'm here dying because this oppression just won't get out of my hair. They form these highlights on my past atrocities, they tangle around my mind, this oppression it manifests as stress in me so that even though I don't color my hair in a couple of years, it'll look like I dyed it gray. So what's my ethnic makeup? I don't have any because your ethnicity isn't something you can just make up. And as far as that shit that my sisters put on their faces, that's not makeup. It's make believe. I, I can't I can't I can't seem to look up at her. And I'm sure that such actions aren't foreign to her because her expression shows that she knows that my mind is in a trance. As her footsteps fade, my ego is left in crutches. And rejection never sounded so sweet. All right. So that's from a student perspective there. And you see they have a good grasp of where we're going with this, which is really saying that our racial identity only serves one purpose, and that is to identify our DNA lineage. It has nothing to do with who we are in terms of these other identities. I mean, I'm African, right? That is my racial DNA. Pigmentation of skin, texture of hair, prone to certain diseases. That's what it says. You know, I love the, uh, I don't love it, but the Sally Field commercial, I love it for this work. The Sally Field commercial, you guys ever see the Sally? I forgot what it's for. I think it's for um, osteoporosis. But at the bottom, you see what it says? Does anybody know? See that you, with those commercials, got to read the little, what does it say? Does anybody know? Say it again. The disclaimer, what does it say? Does anybody know what it says? Something about white, white, white and Asians in terms of being prone to this. That's speaking to racial identity there. So what we're saying is, now that we know this, you cannot identify me by my race other than to say that I am of African descent. That's all it tells you. It does not tell you how smart I am. It does not tell you what music I like. It does not tell you what language I use. It does not tell you anything about my background. And anything that you come with that, you're making an assumption. You're making a prejudice. You're making a bias. So if we have that understanding, then we can take race and put it off the table and, and know that this approach is not racially responsive education. 
It's culturally responsive education. And part of the confusion is we have too much focus on race, not, a fo not enough focus on culture. I don't think it's about racism. I think it's about culturalism. And the students who are not being successful in our schools, it has less to do with the fact that they are of African descent and more to do with the fact that they are being black. And that's why we have to understand that there's a difference between the two. I can meet somebody who's African American, it, and, but immediately know if they are black or not and, and not make a judgment about them. And so our students who are being themselves in terms of their blackness, if we were really to disaggregate the data like that, then we would see this culturalism. We would see this culturalism versus this racism. Now we, we talk about nationality. What's the punchline on that? That is that we were all something before we became Americans, basically. Unless you are of WASP culture. WASP is white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, which is the culture that all the other cultures, in essence, assimilated into. This comes from a body of work known as how the Irish became white, how the Jewish became white, how the Germans became white. If you read those texts, it talks about that cultural assimilation from being Irish, German, Jewish, into being WASP. And that WASP becomes synonymous with American. So to be American, some would say, is really to be WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. We can add in the religious factor as well, OK? But what I really want to get to is culture. And what I want you to do now is I want you to identify what ethnic identity do you subscribe to? What ethnic identity resonates with your soul culturally? What moves you? What makes you think of home, community, and heritage from an ethnic standpoint? And once again, see if you can name two things that you can link to that identification. Two things that make you X in terms of interests, likes, in terms of heritage, in terms of experience. Now remember, we've already released you. We've freed you. We've liberated you. If you are African American, you could say, I subscribe to WASP culture. It's OK. If you are Caucasian American, you could say, I subscribe to Korean culture. Because that's the beauty of culture. You're not locked in. See, I'm locked in racially. Now, we got some of us, we try to change our race, right? We know we got some of those in the celebrity world, right? OK. But it's, there's been uns unsuccessful attempts. You know what I'm saying? But I, I'm, not, I'm not locked in culturally. I'm not locked in culturally. It, you know, I, I, can't, I can move about culturally where I can't racially. What happens, though, some people feel bad about having to say, well, I'm of this race, but I subscribe to this culture because what, a, what society puts on us. Because society says, you look this way, so that means that you should act this way, OK? So in your group, once again, I'm just going to give you two minutes. I'll give you three because this is a tougher topic. Define your ethnic identity. And you cannot say American, all right? You can say WASP, but you cannot say American. Go. Now, just to let you know, you know, we're, we're truncating. This, is, this ends up being about a 90-minute conversation in a full day. Because a lot comes out of that in terms of people talking about their identification. I do want to, well, I can't go back, but oh, yes, I can. What, what, notice the last identity is age, because there is a culture that comes with your age that we talk about. And what that means is that you do certain things culturally just simply based on how old you are. You know? And sometimes, though, we confuse that with the other identities. Remember, it's confusion. So we're saying, we're trying to get you to carve out very specifically what, what, what is my ethnic makeup, if you will, that I can take out of a generational identity or take out of a geographic identity. Meaning that if you subscribe to black culture, there is a commonality among people who subscribe to black culture across the country, regardless if you're from LA, New York, Boston, or Alabama, right? There's a commonality, different from an aged identity that comes with people who may be in their 30s, right? And they grew up in the age of high top fades, whatever, right? 
um, whatever it is. You know, is there some link there? But that link might not be related to the ethnic identity more so than it is to the age identity. And sometimes they cross. They cross. And it's just knowing how these things apply that strengthens us. But I think also not knowing leads to, leads to confusion. So your cultural identity is very complicated because we have to really understand what culture is. We always start off with metaphors and analogies. For, for me, PhD means how many metaphors can you come up with? <laughs> right? And make it work, OK? Because I try them out, and then my family goes, that is not a good metaphor right there. It does not work. So I'm like, OK, how about this one, right? But Wade Noble said it very well. He said, culture is to humans as water is to fish. And it, it, is, it is the lens that we see the world is through that cultural lens. And, and similar to how fish need their own water to survive, right? We all have our aquarium stories of, uh, you know, kind of uh, killing off some fish. Part of the reason why is because we took them out of their water. I know, I know I did. I'll admit it. Okay. The first time I took the fish out of the water to clean the tank, right? Put them back in. The next day they were what? Dead. And then I called and I said, you sold me some really bad fish. What happened? And he, he started laughing once I explained, right? So you're supposed to leave the fish in the water, clean the tank, or keep them in their water. And that's the same thing here. The full analogy, a full metaphor that he uses is this. We're trying to put salt water fish in plain water tanks in terms of our school system. And these students, a lot of students of color, are being put in those plain water tanks and they're not having success. So what must we do? Add some salt to the tank. All right, that's the analogy of Wade Nobles uses. We use this working definition by Viegas and Lucas that is, comprises, for me, the sort of totality of culture. Identifiable community or group that uses a certain language, a certain way of interaction with one another, how you take turns to talk, how you relate to time and space, and how you approach learning. All involved around patterns for us define what we mean in terms of this culture, okay? And in terms of this ethnic identity, if you will, when we say culture. When it comes to African Americans and these groups that we talked about, though, remember I said there's not a validation and a legitimacy. So these are all the precepts, if you will, or, or categories of culture put forth by Wade Nobles in the context of black culture. And the question that we ask is, when you think of black culture, honestly, do you think of all of this right here? Do you think of, all, do you think of its complexity? Or do you think of hip hop and pelvic gyrations? Do you think of certain types of foods? Do you think of movies? You know, it, 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 it bothers me when we talk about black culture and we just name black actresses. And that's, our, that's, the, that's the length of our culture or we talk about uh, music, or we talk about certain foods, when the complexity of any culture is here. All cultures have this, and it's all relative to the culture. How does this play out in terms of stereotypes and generalizations? Well, if you understand black culture, you understand that it is a culture of hard work, working hard, having a strong work ethic. It's in our history. It's in our families. It's in who we are to work hard. If you listen to the mainstream and to the institution in terms of our boys, what do we hear about them as being what? Lazy. That's a stereotype. That's a stereotype. Because culturally speaking, we are a hardworking culture, period. And this notion of laziness does not apply. And how do I know? Well, take me to where they are motivated. Take me to where they have an interest. Take me to where they are being responsive and you're not going to see laziness. You're going to see hard work. But if I come to the classroom, if I come to the system believing that these kids are lazy culturally, then we have what's known as that self-fulfilling prophecy. Or we begin to act out that belief. You're not going to be nothing. You can't write. You can't read. You're not going to do this. And then all of a sudden, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right, versus you can write. You can do this. I'm not going to take, you know, I was in this classroom last week, and this is a very simple example, but it speaks to high expectations. 
There was homeroom, it was guidance. The students are coming in, they're wearing uniforms. This teacher, African-American teacher, she made every one of them young boys tuck their shirts in. Every single one of them. And she didn't, and she didn't let down. And she told them, you are a scholar. You are a student. You have to look like a scholar. You have to look like a student. Tuck your shirt in. And every single one of those boys tuck their shirts in. That's, that's, that has, that's the high expectations that we need in terms of belief system. She's telling them, you are important. You are a student. You are a scholar. Look that look. Now, some people say, well, that's a little thing, but that, that could go a long way in the long run. What about respect? You know, if we listen to mainstream media, if we listen to what we get from the institution, then you would think in black culture we don't respect black women. That's what you would think because we're going on hip-hop, which the mainstream media has replaced for black culture, right? And there was, there was black culture. In fact, there was music before hip-hop. Right. Some people are disappointed to know that, but it was OK. Because of the nature of hip hop, some of it is a disrespect, misogynistic lyrics and such on. We have uh, ex extrapolated to be represented. But if you know anything about black culture, what do you know about respecting the black female? Let's put it like this. If I even form my lips, even just begin to articulate the sound of disrespecting a black female, I would not be with you here today, period. Because a shoe or a brick or something would come upside my head immediately. You don't disrespect. You open a door. You go help with the groceries. You help with the luggage. That's in the culture. So when these students are walking around calling females out of the name, you have to look them dead in the eye. You have to say, that's not who you are. That's not who you are. You're not 50 Cent. You're not whomever. You're not whomever. You are somebody's grandson. You are somebody's son, and I don't think if your mom or your sister came up here, you would want them to be called like that. And I've never had a student say, I don't care. You can call my mom whatever you want to call her. Never heard that. You can call my sister. No, never heard that. But it's how we're going at them. See how y'all talk? That's how y'all do it in y'all community, huh? That's how y'all talk to one. But we don't talk like that here. That's the belief system. How are you, you going to say, we don't talk like that here, but that's how we t it's not true anyway. That's not, not how we talk in our community. So this is what we mean by the complexity. And if we're going to change in terms of the achievement gap, we got to change how we're believing of the students. And if that changes to come about, we got to see things more on the cultural lines versus the racial lines. Then there is what I call the depth of it in terms of what we call cultural determinations. And these are things that are culturally connected through, the stu through anthropological study. It's not just related to black culture. It's a study of all cultures. How they greet one another is culturally based, right? So that soul shake is not something that I got off of good times, right? It was something that was done in my family by my uncles, my granddad, so on and so forth, that was taught to me. But at the same time, I was taught the mainstream handshake. And my uncle would say, when you talk it to the man, this is how you shake his hand. And he demonstrated the mainstream handshake, right? But when you're at home, when you're in the community, it's the soul shake or the black man's hug. I don't go to grandma's house and give her the mainstream handshake because she's going to say, boy, what are you doing, right? You reach that hand out. It's not going to work. Eye contact is culturally based. It's culturally based, right? The anthropological study is this. Every culture, it's all relative, has a certain length of time that it's appropriate to look in someone's eyes, OK? And it varies. In some cultures, for example, a lot of European cultures, it's appropriate to gaze and look long, deep into somebody's eyes. And it sends a message of respect or disrespect. Respect, interest, intrigue. That's the message. In other cultures, sometimes you look at someone and you look away. Is that respect or disrespect? Respect. In the, in the culture, in the, so take it in a school. You have some Asian students or some Latino students. They'll look at the teacher, then they'll look away. And it's a sign of respect. But in a culture of school, it's a sign of what? Disrespect. And the teacher will say, look at me when I'm talking to you. But the student is saying, in my culture, we don't look at you. We look away. Right? That's, a cultural, that's what we call cultural misunderstanding. It's a cultural misunderstanding. In black culture, you look long, you look wrong. 
because it sends a message of what? Disrespect. Disrespect, right? Sends a message of confrontation. And so what I'm, what I'm trying to get you to understand is this is not from hip hop. This is not from uh, TV. This is culturally based, passed down from generation to generation. I can get off any plane anywhere in the country, and I know if there's a young brother on a jetway or whatever, I can't stare him down. Why? Because culturally, I'm sending a message of disrespect. And if he subscribes to black culture, he's going to say, what's up? What you looking at? Why are you looking at me that way? Right? That's cultural. We put it in the context of school, though. We teach the look as a means of classroom management. Right? That's mama's look. Means you cut and you say, you better stop what you're doing right now. But what teachers need to understand that if you look too long, then you look wrong. And the student is going to respond culturally. The student is going to say to the teacher, what? What you looking at? Why are you looking at me? She always got her eyes on me. The, stu- the teacher is going to say, get out. Why? Disrespectful. Defiant. Deviant. Because the teacher is saying, in the context of school, the cultural appropriate thing is, I can look at you. But the student is saying, but in my culture, you staring me down. We got a cultural misunderstanding. And this is what leads to the disapportionment dis, dis, um, of uh, the, the detentions, referrals, suspensions. This is why, because of these cultural misunderstandings. A lot of these students end up in the office, and when you ask them, why are you here? They say, I don't know. I, was just, I just said, what you looking at? She sent me out. They don't have an understanding. So what we have to develop is this cultural sensitivity around the teacher understanding that I got to time my look. I have to use proximity, but guess what? I can't get too close because space is a cultural norm as well. In some cultures, you can get up in somebody's face. In other cultures, it's inappropriate, it's rude. So the students are going to say what? Get out of my face. Why are you in my face? And what is the teacher going to say? Get out. Because in school, this is my space, and I can get in, my, get in your face. Did you hear me, mister? Right? And the students are like, Get out of my face. Get out. Okay? So we have, to, we have to come to an understanding and recognize these behaviors for what they are. And we think that that will lead to not sending them out of the room, but teaching situational appropriateness. What does that mean? That means that the student recognizes, oh, I'm in school. That means that she's going to be looking at me. And I got to code switch. I have to code switch. Right? And once they learn that lesson, they're going to be on the road to success. Because all of us, to make it through the education system, had to learn how to code switch on one level or another. Right? And the students who are not having success are not code switching. And this is what Lisa Delpit talks about when she says explicit instruction. That's the explicit instruction she's talking about. Some of those students, they don't don't get that transaction there. They don't get that, 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 um, that how we relate to one another. I always use the example of interacting with policemen, right? And in my experience, I have never looked at the policemen when they're talking to me as a form of disrespect in a way, right? But some police, they will say, sir, I need you to look at me. And at that particular moment, I got to make a decision. I got to make a decision. I got to make a decision if I'm going to code switch Or am I going to continue to be, in essence, in terms of the mainstream culture, quote, unquote, defiant? Right? So I go, right? Or something like that. Okay? All right? That's how this works. But it has to be automatic, and it has to be done in a way where you don't have to give up who you are. Another thing that's cultural, a lot of people don't know, is how we hold conversation and that period of what the linguists call overlap. Overlap is the space or time when I stop talking and it's appropriate for the other person to start talking, right? And it is varied by culture. In some cultures, there's a big space. That means I stop talking, 1001, 1002, 1003. Now you can start talking. I'll make my point, 1001, right? Then it goes, right? It fluctuates, okay? So in black culture, Look, it's no, it's, it's no space. <laughs> it's, called, oh, it's called jumping in 
that you have to have the ability to jump in. If you don't have the ability to jump in, then you won't get into the conversation. Okay? Right? Now, students come to school with this intact culturally. Right? And what happens is they're penalized in school because they begin jumping in. And a t in school, jumping in is, is considered what? Rude. Interrupting. Now, what I wanted to do is I want to give an example of how we take that cultural norm, go to where the students are, but put it into an instructional strategy. In your packets there, we're just going to read, just because of time, we're just going to read two pages. We're not going to read the whole thing. And we have some extras here. She can help you out there. But I want to read from page 13, Their Eyes Are Watching God. This is where the strips came from. And if you don't have a packet, just kind of look on with someone. Their Eyes Are Watching God. This is Zora Neale Hurston's, uh, you know, premier piece. Um, and she writes in African-American language, if you will, right? And uh, that was what, this is where the strips came from. But I want to do a reading activity with you that's called jump-in reading, right? That builds on what we just talked about culturally. In jump-in reading, here are the rules. No, rule number one, I'm the master jumper inner. That means I can jump in at any time, all right? Rule number two, you're not going to be prompted to read. You can just jump in but you must jump in at a period stop. You have to jump in at a period stop. You can't jump in um, at a other punctuation, line break, any, it has to be a period. If you jump in, I need you to read at least three sentences. All right? Now, two or more, two or more people may jump in at the same time, and if, in that case, we'll, we'll defer to the one who jumped in first, and I'll make the call if necessary. All right? We're just gonna read from the first two pages. We're not gonna do the whole thing. I'll start reading, and at some point, I'll stop, or I want somebody to jump in, okay, and then read loud so everyone can hear you. Ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. A little louder. A little louder. Noisy to read it, and left her mouth kept open, and their ears full of holes. 
T.K. Cake ain't been no boy for some time. He around 30 his own self. She act like we done done something to her, Pearl Stone complained. She the one been doing wrong. You mean you mad because she didn't stop and tell us all her business? Anyhow, what you ever know her to do so bad as y'all make out? The worst thing I ever knowed her to do was taking a few years off her age, and that ain't ever harmed nobody. Y'all makes me tired. The way y'all talking, you think the folks in this town didn't do nothing in the bed except praise the Lord. You have to excuse me, because I'm bound to go take her some supper. Phoebe stood up sharply. Don't mind us, Lulu smiled. Just go right ahead. Us can mind your house for you till you get back. My supper's done. You better go see how she feel. You can let the rest of us know. Lord, Pearl agreed. I done squashed up that little meat and bread too long to talk about. I can stay away from my home long as I please. My husband ain't fussy. All right, we're going to stop there. And the reading activity was jump in reading. And what we're saying is you have students in the class who can jump in. Now we have a, a, a strategy that validates who they are. And they can say, something that I do at home is now a plus at school versus being a minus. And it's incorporated into instruction. But we're not going to stay there. There are other reading strategies that we're going to introduce to transition them to more of what can be expect, expected in academics, in academia, okay? And that's important. We're not going to stay there. We're just going to start there. Also, now you got to read, you got to see what it feels like to read a non-standard language. And that feeling that you got reading that is the same feeling of someone trying to read standard English or academic language. And that is you have a certain oral proficiency. You are proficient in terms of your reading but put a language in front of you that you are unfamiliar with, and then your reading level is rendered lower or slower. And that's the phenomenon that you experience in reading the African American language is the same phenomenon that students who are trying to learn standard English and academic language experience linguistically. All right? And that's going to transition us to talk about language here. And I'm, I'm going to start off with this video, I think, um, that gets you at why we think negatively about Ebonics or why we think ne negatively about African American language, I think. I'm going to show this guy. In 1997, 
26, the Oakland School Board tried to uh, um, get Ebonics taught in school. Members of the Oakland School Board agreed to label so-called Black English or Ebonics as a second language. Ebonics, let me break that down to you. Onics, meaning like phonics, then sound, speech. Then you have Yvonne coming from the word ebony. So basically, it's like black speech. In the 70s, they called it jive. This is part of revolution. Ebonics to me was the dumbest idea ever. Maybe we should give people an example of Ebonics here. As far as the pronunciation goes, let's look at some examples. Hand becomes ham, good becomes goo, and with becomes whip. The only example I remember is the, what you talking about, Willis? If I wanted to say, do you have any maple syrup human beatbox? I would say, hey, do you have maple syrup beatbox? You see, because I dropped some of the articles. Become the drums! <laughs> Food was a way of saying, you silly young man. What are you talking about, Willis? What's up? Why y'all in my sh was a way of saying, the season desist. If I say, I'm gonna kick your m ass, you know what I'm talking about, right? You don't need to worry about anybody. <laughs> Isn't there any controversy over white ebonics? Or I'm gonna say ivonics, ivryonics. Yo, yeah, dude, man, I think I've got the squirts. That doesn't mean, hey, man, I'm gonna use my squirt gun and spray you. It means, hey, man, I just ate some Taco Bell and I have diarrhea. Jesus spoke ebonics. Yes. John chapter 13, verse 19. He said, I be he. That's <laughs> All right. So we see how the mainstream media fools us into thinking deficit or ignorant through the misinformation, right? And if we just go on that, then that's where we get our notions of Ebonics or the non-standard languages. So the first thing we have to go to is the linguistic research, which is what we do. And the linguists are very clear that any characterization, I'm going to skip it to the bottom here, any characterization of Ebonics as slang, mutant, lazy, defective, ungrammatical, or broken English is incorrect and demeaning. That it is seen as a, as a linguistic system that is fundamentally regular beyond vocabulary. That's key. Uh, it has to do with phonics, morphosyntax, grammar, rhetoric, or even pragmatics. You have to understand that language has six dimensions. One of the dimensions is known as the pragmatic dimension, or what is commonly known as the nonverbal cues, right? There are nonverbal cues that are tied linguistically, meaning um, how you may roll your eyes, move your neck, stand akimbo, whatever comes with your language. And this is important to understand the depth and complexity of it is not just vocabulary. It's not just vocabulary. There are three linguistic absolutes, and they're very simple, easy to remember. All language is good. There's no such thing as a bad language, linguistically speaking. There's no such thing as bad French. There's no such thing as street Spanish. There's no such thing as proper English. It's all good linguistically. When society comes and places a judgment on it, that's where we get the value. But in its purest form, it's good. All, lingu all linguistic forms are rule-governed and patterned. They're not made up. They're not hodgepodge. They're not random. They were not created by hip-hop. There was African-American language prior to hip-hop, all right? And we acquired the language that's spoken in home by the primary caregiver. And whatever language that is, that's the language this child is going to come to school speaking at preschool at four years old, at three years old, or five, or at kindergarten at five. That's the language they're going to come speaking, based on the primary caregiver's language, all right? Here's the technical de definition of Ebonics. It wasn't coined in 1997 by Oakland. It was coined in 1973 in St. Louis by, this, by some black linguists who got together because they were tired of the deficit names that the white linguists had given to the language of Africans in America. So it is known, it's a three- Paragraph definition. This is just the first sentence. 
Um, Ebonics is the linguistic and paralinguistic features which on a concentric continuum represent the communicative competence of the West African, Caribbean, and United States slave descendants of African origin. Problem with linguists is they write in ways that puts everybody to sleep, right? So we have to break it down. Ebonics, and I want to give it to you this way. I want to inform you so that you can inform others. And there are really just three quick points that you can make with others. Point number one, Ebonics is a language family. It is not a singular language. It is a language family. It is an umbrella term that refers to all the languages that are spoken in the African diaspora. That's what it is. So it's really ignorant or misinformed to say, do you speak Ebonics? Because you wouldn't say, do you speak Romance? Or do you speak Indo-European? Why? Because those are families of languages. What are, what, are the, the, what are those languages? Well, that's the second point you can make. Those languages are connected to wherever the enslaved Africans were taken throughout um, the enslavement. Because when they got to that particular place in the world, they were given those constraints I told you about earlier. No African tongue, no working in groups, can't speak the language here. So the linguist said they simply took the words that they were hearing, laid them on top of the grammar that they were speaking, and formed, in essence, this hybrid language that's known in Jamaica as a patois, Spanish and a West African base, that's known in Aruba as Dutch pidgin, that's known in Haiti as French Creole, that's known in South America as Black Portuguese, that's known in Peru as Huerga, that's known in North America in... Um, in Georgia as Geechee. That's known throughout the rest of the United States as African American language or black English. And that's known in South Carolina as Gullah. All right? What is the commonality? The commonality is the same grammatical base. We go from country to country, it's the same rules. All right? Now, the third thing that you can point out is that why are you calling it a language? Because some people, they, they be tripping on that that we're calling it a language. Well, the reason why we're calling it a language is because the linguists tell us that, well, you know, if you want to define a language, you can define it as simply saying that if you have a big army, you speak a language. If you have a small army, you speak a dialect. Because our world history of languages tell us that there are some countries that when they were dominated, they spoke dialects. But when they gained independence, they spoke languages. So it's political. The second thing we know is that there is a regional variation to a language that becomes a dialect. So I can be speaking African American language with a southern drawl, y'all, right? Or I can do my New Yorkian accent, or I can bring it to Chicago, <laughs> or I can like do this where we talk in LA like this all the time, <laughs> right? But we're still speaking the same rules of the language. That means we're still using multiple negation. We're still using habitual B, although we're in different parts of the country. And the last part of this is very simple, that part of oppression is taking away somebody's language. It's telling them, you don't have a language. You don't have a culture. Your skin doesn't match ours. Your hair doesn't match ours. And getting us to think negatively about who we are, that's the, that's the process of oppression. And you don't even have to be there to oppress because once the oppressed believe in what has been given, then the oppression will be carried out by themselves. And the oppressor can remove and it will continue. And this, to a large extent has happened. This is why you have some people who say, I don't speak no Ebonics while they're using a multiple negation contract, you know, sentence there. So I don't have time to go over the rules with you, but I, I want to give you one example of what I mean by the rules. But if you look in your packet, starting on page 20 and 21, you will see a, what we call a contrast of analysis chart, which are the black English rules. And this is what's published in the Prentice Hall series. Because in California, teachers have to address non-standard language issues in their teaching. It's in, the, it's, in our, it's in our education framework. So all of our textbook publishers have these elements in the textbooks for teachers who have students who speak non-standard languages. So it's part of the, the ed, the um, educational policy there, okay? Um, so if you take, for example, habitual B, 
Habitual B is the one that's made fun of, like she said at the end of the clip, I be he, right? If you go to West Africa and you study the B form, you recognize that the B form has what's known as an habituality use. It refers to things in an ongoing sense as over time in terms of it's, it, it's in existence. So if you really analyze I be he from the scriptural standpoint, the quote is I be he, but it's really saying from, if you look at it from the West African language, I am in essence everywhere. I am always in this existence. That's how it works. So in the, la in the language, you could say, um, she be late to work, okay? So when you translate that to standard English, you must have an is or are verb plus the use of an adverb or adverbial phrase. That is the correct translation. So if I say, she be late to work, someone translate based on what I just explained. That girl is always late to work. What am I listening for? The is and the always. Because that is the linguistic equivalent to the use of the B form. If you translate it to she late, or if, if I messed it up. If, if you translate it to she is late to work, that is an, in, an incorrect translation. Because the correct translation, I just gave it to you, is what? She late to work. So if I want to say present tense, like she late right now, I would say, she late to work, right? But if I want to say, just sit down, just take, have some coffee, because it's going to be a while, because she is always late to work, then I would say, she be late to work. That's the accurate translation. If you understand this, it gives you a connection with the students, a rapport. It also empowers them. So if the, when, the, when the students used to come, when I was um, working as like a dean, the students would come to the office, and they would say, that teacher, she be tripping. Right? Now I understand the language, so I understand that they're saying what? She is always being a bother to me. <laughs> right? So I know that it's ongoing, it's something I need to investigate, it's something I need to look into, it's something I need to call the teacher about. But if the, if the students come down and say, man, that teacher, she tripping, then I know it's right at that moment. They're saying right now, she is a bother to me, and I can handle it differently. Or, you know, they'll be out on the yard, and you hear them say, man, you cheating. They're saying what? You cheating right now. Or they'll, like, walk away from the game and say, I'm not playing with you because you be cheating. You always cheat. That's how we have to understand the language, okay? Now, that's just one rule. There, we do about 30 rules. We do about 30 rules and explain it the way we explain it right now. Let me show you how it looks in the classroom. And then we can uh, end with questions um, in our remaining moments. This is about a six-minute clip. This comes from PBS, Do You Speak America? And they came to L.A. to see how we, was doing, how we would do this teaching um, around the linguistic piece. And this is a fifth-grade classroom. I think. Oh, maybe not. I don't know. Sometimes it takes a while to catch up to where I am. So we'll see. Let me see. Let me try it like this. Maybe not. I have a backup, though. It's just a longer clip. The one that I want to show you, actually, which is what the universe might be saying to me, is a longer clip that I didn't... That um, So what I'm going to do is... I really wanted to show you this clip. So the, that was the universe way of telling me you need to show this clip, right? Um, because this is really our school and how our school looks in its entirety. It's just that it's a longer clip, right? And we, we're down to the last 15 minutes. So I'm going to show it to a certain point, and then we'll just stop, and then um, we can have time for question and answer. So we'll watch six minutes of this, okay? It's like nine minutes long, but we'll watch six minutes of it. We're having to our sound. 
Uh oh, technology, huh? Is that something I'm doing? Oh wait, no. Various nation builders, people who've helped make this country what it is today. One of those people that we've already studied is Ida B. Wells Barnett. So we've already read through the book once. Ida B. Wells Barnett, A Voice Against Violence. What we're going to do today is paired reading. So you are going to get with your partner and you are going to reread an important chapter, uh, chapter four, which is called The Struggle Against Violence. Now I'm going to review quickly again what's expected of you during paired reading. We started with culturally responsive literature, Ida B. Wells Barnett, because we've been studying the Nation Builder Unit. Um, and so after I had already read it aloud to them, we went back for a second reread. And so we use reciprocal teaching with the paired reading, where they use questioning, clarifying, summarizing, etc., in order to, to check for comprehension. You know how they change the laws? Yeah, and circulate exactly what people like. No, now I know why they want, now I know why she was here. On June 27th, 1890, why would people think I didn't stop working? Maybe because she had got married and it was probably difficult to start working since she had a child, but since the baby was born, her work was better. Okay. okay, one good thing that a good reader does is identify what a character is like by the things that they do or the things that they say. One of our third grade standards is to be able to look what a character says or does and determine their characteristics, their personality traits. So uh, what we did was using the information from Ida B. Wells, since we've already read it once and we reread a part of it, uh, we went back to find adjectives that describe them. So what we are going to do is we are going to think of some adjectives to help describe Ida B. Wells Barnett. Adjectives. We're going to use think, pair, share. What is an adjective? Think. Once you have it in your mind, go ahead and put your, head, your hand on your head to show that you're ready. Okay, turn to your partners. Pair up. Table four, person three. That'd be Joshua. What is an adjective? An adjective is like a word that describes something about a noun. Okay, so we are going to think of adjectives that describe Ida B. Wells Barnett. And we're going to add them to our bubble map. Because our bubble map is used to do what? Give me a shout out. That's right. That's right. We're using a bubble map to describe something. So in this case, we're describing Ida B. Wells Barnett. So let's go ahead and write our subject in the center. Okay, what you're going to do at this time is you're going to discuss in your group some different adjectives that may describe Ida B. Wells. Now be thinking about the things that she did in Chapter 4 or the things that she may have said in Chapter 4 or even the rest of the book. Words that you will use to describe her whole personality, not just how she's feeling at any particular moment. So we're going to use numbered heads together. So when I say go, you're going to do bottoms up, and you're going to decide on one adjective for the group. Go. Because she didn't stop, she didn't stop working just because she had a baby. I say inspiring. Yeah. I need all number ones to stand up, please. So for table number one, Omar, what did you guys come up with as an adjective to describe Ida? Heroic. Good five-star word. I'm going to go ahead and write that in our bubble map. Oh, right. Okay. What word did you guys come up with? We came up with unstopping. Unstopping or unstoppable. Very good, Zalika. Give us some love. Nice job. What did your table group come up with? Just. Just. Excellent. Give her some love. We came up with nice. Nice, okay. One of these words doesn't quite fit as nicely as most of them. You guys use some excellent words from your personal thesaurus, some five-star words. But there's one word here that we, I think we could find some synonyms for, and that would be the word nice. One way we can use the personal thesaurus is to expand the student's own vocabulary. And so we started with the word nice, and then other students added to that word, have already a concept for it. So we need other words that we add to it. So I want you to think of Another word that means the same thing as nice. In order to do this, you're going to use give one, get one. Where you're going to get up and give your word, your synonym to somebody, and you're going to get one from them as well. So you should sit back down.
around with at least two synonyms for the word nice. Go. My word that means the same thing as nice is generous. My, my synonym that means the same word, word as nice is kind. My synonym for kind for nice is amicable. My synonym for kind is nice is kind. in our personal thesaurus. Me, I'm going to turn to N for nice because that's my easy word. And why would you turn to K in your personal thesaurus, Taylor? Because kind is what I use at school and with my friends and with my family members. So that when you go and do your writing and you want to find a synonym for kind, you can look up under K and find all these other five-star words? Uh-huh. Excellent. So once we combined everybody's synonyms for the word nice, then we added that to the personal thesaurus. Now, the reason it's a personal thesaurus is because the students put it under their own word. According to research, vocabulary is one of the primary reasons for students' success or failure. We want to make sure that they have a good repertoire of vocabulary for comprehension purposes, for writing, and for speaking. Uh, From there, we want to talk about situational appropriateness of language. Since we do a lot of code switching and a lot of contrastive analysis, one form of that is situational appropriateness. So that not only can they code switch, but they know when and where to do it. In Chapter 4, one very important part is when Ida gets to go talk to President McKinley about what's going on in her country. And so some of you have created a role play about situational appropriateness and the languages that she's going to be using. So we're going to start with our introducer, Zalika Jefferson. This skit is about Ida B. Wells going to President McKinley and talking about talking to him about the lynching going on in her country. It is nice to meet you, President McKinley. My name is Ida B. Wells Barnett, and I came to talk to you so so I just came to talk to you about something horrible that is happening in our country. <clears throat> Hello, Mrs. Wells Barnett. What is it that you want to talk about? <laughs> Did you know that 10,000 black men and women have been lynched since the Civil War? I'm shocked. I'm shocked too, President McKinley. And my people should not be treated this way. And I want you to do something to stop this injustice immediately. I will do everything I can to stop this ju- injustice right away. Thank you. Thank you for your help in this matter, President McKinley. Me and my people really need your support. This part of the skit is about Ida going home and talking to her husband, Ferdinand, about what happened when she went to go talk to President McKinley. So what happened, Ida? Well, I talked to President McKinley about the lynching. I told her I would not going to put up with it no more. I'm sure proud of you, Ida. You do a lot for your folks. Well, I just don't want no black person walking down the street and being lynched just for being black. That ain't right, Frederick, and I gotta do something about it. I hope President McKinley do something about it, too. I, me too, Frederick, me too. All right, I'm gonna stop it there. Um, what remains is they're gonna talk about which language is appropriate and why. And why, why do we make the choices that we make? That's what remains. Do some more activities there. But uh, we're almost out of time. We have about five, six minutes for questions, comments from the audience. Q&A? Yes. What do you do when the class is not on the same reading level? 
that you have some kids who can use the word amicable and others who use kind. I mean, not right. that some kids with language difficulties because they speak another language, for instance. Right. Well, when it comes to reading what's uh, mandated by the state, which is, which is what they were reading um, in terms of our school, then we all, we, they have to read grade level material. Um, and then we have another part of the day where they read at their reading level. So by offering them both, we think we can get at those issues. And then the utilization of the strategy. So with the personal thesaurus, if nice is my word, that's still validated and firm, but I'm hearing all that other vo vocabulary being used in the room, and I'm writing them in my um, thesaurus so they become the synonyms. So we work on synonym development, but never negating where they're coming from with the use of nice or kind. Yeah. Someone else? Way in the back there. Hi, I just had a quick question in terms of the strategies you, you employed. Um, for example, the jump in, it was called jump in reading. Right. Or, um, is cultural, is, I guess my next question really goes to culture. Is culture something that's really blanket? Like, can you really assume that, that jumping in is something that, that occurs in every African American? No. Um, and then furthermore, that was one half of the question. The other half would be, um, what do you do in a multicultural setting to, I guess, to make sure that you're, I guess, being sensitive to each cultural background? And right. would you employ these same kind of strategies in a multicultural right. setting? Right. No, clear. remember, you can be African American and not be black. So you, we can't make that assumption. We don't make that assumption. There may be some African American students who are uncomfortable jumping in. We, we, we realize that. In a multicultural setting, we, we really give a sort of spectrum of strategies. So jump in is just one. I have another one that's just the opposite of jump in that may be more culturally sensitive to other cultures. The point with the teacher is that you have to do them all so that you can reach all the students. And then if I'm doing something that is uncomfortable for your culture, I'm going to ask you to come out of your comfort zone. And to us, that defines what we mean by cross-cultural connections and then becomes the true definition of multiculturalism. All right. I think she had, and you have one up here. Go ahead. Um, a point you talked about uh, earlier in your speech going with the Switch, almost switching codes with talking and with not only with talking but the cultural connections of looking away and being able to in a sense how we've all assimilated to the the wasp way of doing those things it can you think of any one reason why African Americans especially African American men are having more difficulty than um, the men in other cultures or is is there some one point that's causing that or do you think it's a combination of points well, I think most would say there's a combination of points, but there are two, I think, that sort of stand out. One is opportunity. And what we know is that assimilation is based around economics. And most people assimilate, they do it because there's an economic viability to it. So when you look at it in terms of African-American males, you have to look at the opportunity to, to do that. Um, and how that balances out over time. So then the argument becomes, is it the cart before the horse or the horse before the cart? Meaning, is it a situation where African-American males are not being given the opportunity or, being t or taking the opportunity? And that's, to me, that's where it gets all into the debate. But we know that assimilation is connected to opportunity, and that's connected to making money. And we use the research of Irish, Germans, Jewish, because what, what we find is, they wanted to be white because it was connected to prosperity. It wasn't connected to being patriotic. It wasn't connected to WASP culture. The second piece then really gets into the hard notion of racism, basically, um, and how the black male is really, you know, as he indicated at the beginning with the, all the statistics and such, so at the bottom of the totem pole in that, and therefore it is a, it is a larger climb on two levels, meaning that for a black male to assimilate, you almost get a harder treatment for a quote-unquote selling out. You know what I'm saying? So you have to deal with that. Um, and then it, is, it, it tends to be a harder climb, period, just in terms of navigating the system. And that's where some would say the institutional raci racism becomes a factor. Yeah. That was right, yes. Yeah. Um, so um, in the early 2000s I did some training with teachers around culture teaching and learning and the 
the, the way that I approached it really was to help teachers learn about themselves as cultural beings. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm just wondering where does that piece fit into the training of these teachers right. uh, for the children? Right. It's it's the first. It's a important piece, and it's the first. The the identity exercise that we did. That's where that comes out. Um, it's a it's a big piece, and that's where we start in the first uh, two-hour block, and we tell the teachers that in order to be culturally responsive, the first thing you have to do is be attuned to where you are in terms of your identity and how you feel about other cultures. Now, we don't spend a lot of time on that, but we do talk about it as an important aspect to becoming culturally responsive because, as we know, that could be a hindrance if you're not in tune with your own. Because what we're finding is if I could get a teacher to admit, let's just say in an extreme sense, I'm racist, believe it or not, that actually opens the door to them using some of these strategies because what they realize is that I can still get more engagement in my room, but I don't necessarily have to believe in all the things that you're saying around the culture and language piece. Like, I don't necessarily believe in the Sibonic stuff, but if you're telling me if I can get them to do some code switching exercises and they're going to learn, you know, better, quote unquote, English, then I'll do it. And so in that context, we take it. But I tell them in exchange, I need you to open up and, and talk about who you really are and how do you feel about these students. And I've had teachers stand up when we do like a, we would spend like two or three days with them by the third day admitting I'm afraid of my black male students, you know, and having that type of open conversation. And that's going to open the door to where we're trying to get with the strategies. My school, um, our school, it's uh, about 60 percent African-American and the rest are white. Asian, Latino. So we're not all black teachers. Um, with Believe it or not, with white teachers, people say, well, who's the prime candidate to do this type of teaching? And what we found is it's, it's a young white female teacher because they, those teachers tend to have a, a, a worldview that allows them to open up and um, to the approach in terms of use of the strategies. And um, sometimes um, with um, Older black female teachers, it's a harder sell because they're coming from like a bootstrap mentality and like, you know, I didn't need to do this when I was going to school, so they don't need to do it. So you have to, you have to navigate through that, and it's, it becomes a harder sell. It's not saying that they don't do it, but it's just a harder sell, whereas the young white female teacher, it's an easier, it's an easier sell. Yeah. Any other questions? No? All right. want well, to thank you for your time, your energy. Hope you got something out of it. As always, you ask questions make me uncomfortable, and I learn something every time. <laughs> you now know why Dr. Holly doesn't like me, because I always say, I need to come for a couple hours just to talk to people once. He says, no, I like to do this for three or four days. So I'm hoping now that uh, you've found your way to Boston and that we'll try to continue this in a longer uh, time period uh, next time. But tomorrow um, at 9 o'clock in the student lounge, Dr. Holly will be available just to continue the conversation and dialogue with any um, faculty or, or staff. And, that, and then at um, 10.30 for students for about, an hour, about 75 minutes. So it'll be available. We want to break it up because I think that there's different issues in those different groups. So he'll be available in the student lounge in the School of Education, which is on 4th, two and a half, right? So if you've been in the School of Education, you know that that's a weird place. So it's like uh, the kitchen. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for your time, and thank you again, Dr. Holly. Thank you.